Good evening. I'm your host, Karen Hudis, and this show is the 34th segment in the DC TV series on the Network of Global Corporate Control. Today's segment is following up on a prayer of Ferdinand Marcos. If America fails, then the world is lost. At the end of World War II, Ferdinand Marcos, who was the lawyer for José Rizal, who was the superior general of the Jesuits at the time, put the world's international monetary gold reserves and other wealth into a trust for the benefit of humanity for 50 years. That trust is called the Global Debt Facility, and it's administered by the Board of Governors of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. The Board of Governors is 188 ministers of finance and development. I'm the lawyer for the Global Debt Facility. The Federal Reserve does not have the United States Monetary Gold Reserves, and neither does the U.S. Treasury. The Global Debt Facility has put liens on the Federal Reserve in the 11 states where the Federal Reserve banks are located. That's because the Federal Reserve is bankrupt. That's because the Federal Reserve has actually issued over $200 trillion back in the 30s, and that uh, those bonds, they're called Treaty of Versailles bonds, they've been uh, compounding interest. They're now worth over $2 quadrillion. So we don't owe the Fed money on country debt. It's actually that um, all of the country debt can be offset against this two quadrillion dollars. The Fed's dishonesty in refusing to admit that people do not hold valid legal title to their property, that federal judges are sitting in bogus courts that are not the courts in Article Three of the Constitution because the United States federal government is being run according to a second secret constitution that the banks put into place in 1871 instead of the Constitution of 1789 that many people still think is in effect. People's opinion of the legal profession has tanked. So has their opinion of journalists. Two-thirds say the national news media has a negative effect on the country. And just this past week, I tweeted something which was retweeted 52 times. I said, let's face it, none of the media is telling the truth. And the reason why is because the media is owned by this network of global corporate control. We know this for a fact because three mathematicians at the Federal Institute of Technology uh, did an analysis of who owns the 43,000 companies on the capital markets, and they found out that uh, it's actually all one company. Uh, <laughs> this network of global corporate control is really one single conglomerate. That's because the uh, board of uh, directors of these companies have the same people on them, an interlocking, um, it's called a bow tie arrangement. It's a very interesting study. I would recommend that you read it. It's been published since 2011. And it's really um, quite extraordinary that uh, this has not received more press coverage. That's because the media, as I said, is bought and paid for by the network of global corporate control. Uh, no government has challenged my statement that I'm legal counsel to the global debt facility. Instead, each day brings new information as more and more people are catching on. Why is the United States one of the last holdouts for the network of global corporate control? One reason is because its people are armed. The Second Amendment reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Calls for stricter gun control after reports of mass shooting at San Bernardino, that's not the way people see it. They're stocking up on more guns. The Pew Research Center found last December that 57% of Americans say they believe owning a gun helps protect people from crime. That's up from 48% in 2012. And I'd like to show a clip right now um, talking about the Second Amendment. 
Hi everybody, I'm Bill Whittle and this is The Firewall. You know, every time there's a shooting in America, our moral betters on the left immediately ammo up the assault rifle of their rhetorical arsenal, namely, our country's sick, twisted obsession with personal firearms, our adolescent psychosexual, dangerous and frankly embarrassing when facing our European film critic friends, American gun culture. So, hopping over to the ever-reliable Wikipedia, for example, we discover that when it comes to per capita gun ownership, the USA does in fact top the list in glory. When measured as the number of guns per 100 residents, the US comes in first at 90. 90 guns per 100 residents. Evidence for the progressives on the left that they do in fact live in the murder capital of the world because when it comes to gun ownership, America is number one with a bullet with by far the highest per capita gun ownership in the world. 90 guns per 100 people is half again more than the number two spot held by Serbia with 58. Now, all we have to do to prove the left-wing progressive weenie case for banning guns is to do a quick search for the per capita murder rate. And sure enough, leading the number two country, again, by about half again more, with 90 murders per 100,000 people is Honduras. Socialist gun controlled Honduras. Because even though America has by far the highest per capita gun ownership rate, we do not have the highest per capita murder rate. And unfortunately for the progressive leftist argument, we're not second either. Or third. In fact, when it comes to per capita murders, Team USA didn't even make the top five. As a matter of fact, we didn't even make the top 10, or the top 20, or the top 30, or the top 40. We're not in the top 50 per capita murders. Gun culture America is not in the top 60 nations in terms of per capita murders, or the top 70, or even the top 80, or the top 90. Of the 218 nations and territories listed for per capita murders, the United States of America, Murderville, USA, did not break the top 100. We are, with 4.7 murders per 100,000 people in 2012, number 111. 111th place puts us near the top of the bottom half of all the nations and territories in the world when it comes to total per capita murders, and virtually all, if not all, of those nations ranked higher than us are big state socialist utopias with stringent gun control laws. How tragically disappointing that must be for our moral superiors, and unfortunately for the left, it gets a lot worse because 111th place, America's murder rate of 4.7 per 100,000 citizens, is artificially much higher than it should be because it includes so many deadly, murderous, toxic places like number one on the list of highly gun controlled, democratically governed since the Stone Age murder pits like Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, with strict gun control laws, has a per capita murder rate of 54.6 murders per 100,000 citizens. If Detroit were its own country, it would just beat Venezuela for second as the most murderous country in the world behind Honduras. America's 111th place, 4.7 murder per 100,000 people, also includes, in order, democratically controlled, heavily gun controlled New Orleans with 53.2 murders per 100,000, St. Louis with 35.5, Baltimore with 34.9, Newark with 34.4, Oakland with 31.8, followed by Stockton, 23.7, Kansas City, 22.6, Philadelphia, 21.5, Cleveland, 21.3, Memphis, 20.2, and Atlanta, 19.0, and of course, Chicago with 18.5 murders per 100,000 people per year. America's per capita average of 4.7 murders includes all of these high crime areas. The first city to appear in gun mad Texas is Dallas, which isn't even in the top 20. America's overall average of 4.7 is as low as it is because of places like Plano, Texas. It's the last city on the list with a murder rate of 0.5. Four. Now, having been to Plano, Texas several times, I can tell you with confidence that virtually every home in Plano, Texas has an entire arsenal of AR-15 assault rifles, semi-automatic shotguns, 30-06 hunting rifles, they got 45s, 357s, they got 38s, they've got 9mm, they have an assortment of 22s for the kids to practice with, not to mention every species of tomahawk, bowie knife, hunting knife, jackknife, bayonet, switchblade, they've got pointy rocks, they've got sharp sticks, 
the per capita murder rate in Gun Nuts Central is 0.4 per 100,000. If the United States of America as a nation had the same murder rate as Plano, Texas, we would not be 111 out of 218. We'd be 211 out of 218, well below Switzerland at 0.6, half of Germany, Spain, and Denmark at 0.8 murders, and well, well below half of New Zealand, the Netherlands, Austria, Italy, France, and Australia. If all of America had the murder rate of the gun nut capital of Gun Culture USA, Plano, Texas, then America's per capita murder rate would be one quarter of those murderous, violent, rampaging, death-worshipping Belgians with their horrific 1.6 murders per 100,000. So maybe it's not the guns. Maybe it's the people holding the guns. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to visit us at truthrevolt.org. And to keep these messages coming, please consider making a donation by clicking here. The most important part of the global currency reset is how to clean up the corruption going forward. We have to start out by understanding where we are. As far as the non-governmental organizations that claim they represent us, none of them could be bothered to confirm the corruption that I've been reporting. This also includes organizations that are telling us what to do with our pensions, like the Association of American Retired Persons, groups claiming that they're fighting corruption, or groups that claim they represent us in national elections, like the League of Women Voters. What does this mean? These organizations are managed and directed by leadership installed by the network of global corporate control. It will be necessary to form discussion groups with people whom you know and trust personally and to keep these discussion groups going so that you're able to compare and contrast and collaborate without being managed. We're not starting from scratch. Many people get it. Here's an example of what one group in Belgium did during a hearing on the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. These secret negotiations are really the agenda of the network of global corporate control. The network of global corporate control wants to remove banking safeguards, food safety rules banning genetically modified organisms, regulating toxic chemicals, and end privacy laws. Good afternoon. I am Malenz, and I come from the richest country in the world. It is located in the richest continent in the world, in the west of the richest continent. My country is called Sierra Leone. On the surface, we are blessed with infinite beauty and abundance of flora and fauna. producing the most exquisite harvest of coffee, cocoa, fruits, vegetables, and caoutchouc. You name it, we've got it. We also have diverse wildlife and vast marine resources, and waterfalls and rivers, the most beautiful beaches. The land is gold. Besides gold and diamonds, we have about 20 precious minerals, huge petroleum reserves that have been discovered. We have platinum, ilminites to make titanium, rutile to coat jets, iron ore, tantalite, also known as coltan, used in your mobile phones and computers, bauxite for aluminum production, zinc, chrome ore, copper, coal, phosphates, potassium, salt, lead, granite, asbestos, nickel, Circa. exquisite timber, like mahogany and tea. The first sub-Saharan university, prior to that, there was one in the kingdom of Timbuktu, which was the first university in the world. Which, of course, is inhabited by the most beautiful souls. And we have the most beautiful stems in the world. <laughs> of course, the West needs Africa's resources, most desperately, to power airplanes, cell phones, computers, and engines. And the golden diamonds, of course. A status symbol to determine their powers by decor and to give value to their currencies. 
One thing that keeps me puzzled, despite having studied finance and economics at the world's best universities, the following question remains unanswered. Why is it that 5,000 units of our currency is worth one unit of your currency, where we are the ones with the actual gold reserves? It's quite evident that the aid is in fact not coming from the West to Africa, but from Africa to the Western world. The Western world depends on Africa in every possible way, since alternative resources are scarce out here. So how does the West ensure that the free aid keeps coming? By systematically destabilizing the wealthiest African nations and their systems, and all that backed by huge PR campaigns leaving the entire world under the impression that Africa is poor and dying and merely surviving on the mercy of the West. Well done, Oxfam, UNICEF, Red Cross, Life Aid, and all the other organizations that continuously run multi-million dollar advertisement campaigns depicting charity porn to sustain that image of Africa globally. Ad campaigns paid for by innocent people under the impression to help with their donations. While one hand gives under the flashing lights of cameras, the other takes in the shadows. We all know the dollar is worthless, while the euro is merely charged with German intellect and technology, and maybe some Italian pasta. How can one expect donations from nations that have so little? It's super sweet of you to come with your colored paper in exchange for our golden diamonds. But instead, you should come empty-handed, filled with integrity and honor. We want to share with you our wealth and invite you to share with us. The perception is that a healthy and striving Africa would not disperse its resources as freely and cheaply, which is logical. Of course, it would instead sell its resources at world market prices, which in turn would destabilize and weaken Western economies, established on the post-colonial free meal system. Last year, the IMF reports that six out of ten of the world's fastest growing economies are in Africa, measured by their GDP growth. The French Treasury, for example, is receiving about $500 billion year in, year out, in foreign exchange reserves from African countries based on colonial debt they forced them to pay. Former French President Jacques Chirac stated in an interview recently that we have to be honest and acknowledge that a big part of the money in our banks comes precisely from the exploitation of the African continent. In 2008, he stated that without Africa, France will slide down in the rank of a third world power. This is what happens in the human world, the world we have created. Have you ever wondered how things work in nature one would assume that in evolution the fittest survives. However, in nature, any species that over, is overhunting, overexploiting the resources they depend on as nourishment, natural selection would sooner or later take the predator out because it offsets the balance. So I want to thank DCTV for making this uh, series available. It's one of the few places that you can find out what's really going on. Uh, one of the things that happened uh, recently is that um, the elites are paying close attention to the unraveling of the network of global corporate control. And uh, because of this, some of the people are trying to cash in on the world's wealth. And they're, they're sending me emails trying to cut a deal. On the 2nd of December, Ferdinand Marcos' son, Tiburcio Villamor Marcos, Talano Tajian IV, 
requested that we form a partnership. And he said in this email that I might now be something called the Overseer Mandate Trustee. <laughs> I already knew that I was allowed to go in front of the uh, interbank screens to see what the accounting is on the global debt facility. I found this out in uh, a, a number of ways. One way is when uh, a company called YCT that's located in uh, Taiwan asked me to do this on their behalf. Another time was when uh, somebody who I had asked uh, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence to find out who this person was, was threatening me if I didn't go in front of that screen. Um, in any event, I have said to all of these uh, people that the only way I'm going to go in front of the interbank screens is when I am back at my office inside the World Bank and uh, that I can be sure that there are safeguards in place so that uh, money doesn't go missing because of my access. Um, so uh, once I, I made this information available that um, Tiburcio uh, Villamor Marcos wanted to enter into a partnership, the emails disappeared from my inbox, but I had already um, put them out on the internet so people could see that. Uh, there's another very interesting piece of information. And um, maybe you can put this picture up now of um, Queen Victoria and her natural father. Um, this information came to me from a Dutch knight. I'll call him Sir Hank. Uh, what he wanted me to know was that um, Queen Elizabeth II is illegitimate, and the real monarch of England is now living in Portugal. Um, Sir Hank forwarded this picture. You can see that there's a remarkable resemblance to Queen Victoria and her father, who, according to Sir Hank, was really Jacob Rothschild. Uh, and one of the other things that uh, Sir Hank told me was that uh, when Queen Victoria was 14, she had a child, um, and just shortly before her uh, giving birth, she married the father of her child, who was King George V of Hanover. Um, and according to Sir Hank, Queen Victoria never divorced um, her son's father. Her son was named Marcos Manuel. And what this means is that Victoria's son, Edward VII, who was uh, the great-grandfather of Elizabeth II, um, that because you can't be married to two, to two people, that um, Edward VII was illegitimate and the um, real monarch of the, um, the United Kingdom is a descendant of Victoria's first son. Um, Queen Victoria gave many uh, keepsakes to her eldest son, who she wrote to and spent time with. And as I put this information out on the internet, uh, Betsy Banfield Malone, who uh, you met a couple of weeks earlier, she tweeted that we now have a family feud over the throne of England. These interesting stories are signs that the elites are rushing to join the rest of us so that we can get on with the global currency reset. Uh, there's considerable noise and confusion because this system has been in place for millennia, not just centuries. And that's why um, it's really very interesting. We're, we're living in very interesting times. Uh, the network of global corporate control is unable to adapt to a reality where many of us can understand what is really going on and where we're able to broadcast this so that others can see as well. In closing this segment, I saved one of the best signs that the network of global corporate control is on its last legs. And that is, I wanted to follow up on bank-owned life insurance. Do you remember all the bank employees, some of them in their 20s and 30s, who were committing suicide? J.P. Morgan Chase invests nearly $18 billion in BOLI, that's bank-owned life insurance assets, and at the end of last year, uh, comparing this with uh, Citigroup, which spent $8.8 .8 Both banks are global financial institutions 
with commercial and investment banking operations and each employs close to a quarter of a million employees. It's J.P. Morgan Chase that's experienced more suicide as bankers. And Martins at Wall Street on Parade tried to find out more about the uh, bank-owned insurance policies, and he was told that he couldn't have this information because it was a trade secret. This is certainly an incentive for agents of the network of global corporate control to switch to the side of the Coalition for the Rule of Law. What is that coalition? It's the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. It's the Group of 77, which is really 134 developing countries. And it's the United States minus the Federal Reserve. I pointed out to Pennsylvania's Secretary of State, Pedro Cortez, that Maryland's Secretary of State, John C. Wobensmith, had recorded the financing statements on the agents of the network of global corporate control. They're in default. In Maryland, two of those agents are J. Thomas Manger, who's Montgomery County's chief of police, and he's also chief of the major city's chiefs association, and also Kathy Lanier. She's chief of police of the District of Columbia. Uh, I have been talking about the, co the commercial liens that I have filed against these agents because they were not doing their jobs. And when you don't do your job, you're, um, you're, uh, you can be sued in tort. Um, my claim was that they were preventing me from going to my office, and their preventing me from going to my office was against their duties. They were acting outside of their jobs when they prevented me from going back to my job at the World Bank. There is no love lost between the elites and the network of global corporate control. That's for sure. I'd like to thank you for listening to another segment of the network of global corporate control, and see you next week. Good evening. I'm your host, Karen Hudis, and this show is the 35th segment in the DC TV series on the network of global corporate control. Today's segment will continue to follow up on a prayer of Ferdinand Marcos. If America fails, then the world is lost. At the end of World War II, Ferdinand Marcos, who was the lawyer for Jose Rizal, the superior general of the Jesuits at the time, put the world's international monetary gold reserves and other wealth into a trust called the Global Debt Facility for the benefit of humanity for 50 years. The story of how the CIA overthrew Ferdinand Marcos's presidency in the Philippines went viral on the internet last week. I'll summarize the story, which a friend in the Philippines uploaded on the internet and forwarded to me. A prominent journalist in the Philippines, Eric A. San Juan, originally published this story in 1998. San Juan was friends with James Brandon Foley, a CIA agent in the U.S. Embassy, in 1986 when the EDSA revolution overthrew Ferdinand Marcos. EDSA is named for Epifanio de los Santos Avenue, the street of the CIA and Vatican-engineered demonstrations against Ferdinand Marcos. The story also includes how Ted Koppel and Newsweek tried to destabilize Ferdinand Marcos, how the mainstream media ran stories blackmailing the Marcoses, and they gave promises to um, the workers and renegade generals that they would be able to immigrate to the United States. Cardinal Jaime Sin played a very prominent role. Sin told Cory Aquino, who ended up replacing Marcos, that she should hide in a Cebu convent during the coup. The CIA used traitor Voltaire Gazmin to secure Cory in Cebu. After the coup, Marcos left the Philippines and went to Hawaii. He did this peacefully 
to prevent deaths during this seizure of power. And he did this at the insistence of Cardinal Sin, who was backed up by the Vatican and by the United States State Department. Corey ended up heading the Philippines after the coup. And here is the deal that was offered to Ferdinand Marcos by the Trilateral Commission, which Marcos turned down. He was told that he should sign over all the assets in the global debt facility, except for one-fourth of 1% 1 commission. And by the way, that amount of the commission, that is the amount of the commission that we are going to be offering those people who will be signing these assets. Because as I've been mentioning, these assets are still in the global debt facility. They're available, and they're the assets that we are going to be using in the global currency reset. Uh, another part of the deal that was offered to Ferdinand Marcos for signing away the world's wealth was that um, the Philippines should lose their own currency, and the Philippines' currency would become uh, dollar-denominated, and people in the Philippines, instead of being given actual money, would have to use a debit card system. By the way, that's, that's what's now in place in uh, Norway. They're experimenting with the Norwegians on that approach. And the other thing that they were asking Ferdinand Marcos to sign away was to sign away all the natural resources to give the bankers perpetual rights to natural resources in the Philippines. In my tweet where I forwarded this story, I included a list of the assets in the global debt facility. Uh, it, it's over 1 million uh, metric tons of gold. And it also includes gemstones, artwork. And uh, in my tweet, I showed how the CIA and the International Court of Justice were still trying to regain control over the assets. These are the assets that Ferdinand Marcos preserved for us. And um, I consulted with the Board of Governors on the World Bank and IMF. And on their behalf, I wrote back to the International Court of Justice and I said that they had absolutely no jurisdiction over these assets. That's because in the bilateral mines field breakthrough successor agreement that governs the global debt facility, it says very specifically in section 11 that the courts have zero jurisdiction. It was simply a power grab. And um, anyone can see that that power grab was foiled. So those assets are there, they're available, and we are now going to be deploying them. Um, in the, uh, the documents that I showed, I included a, a lot of correspondence, including, by the way, a letter that went from China to, um, to John Kerry about uh, some of the uh, shenanigans that are going on in the um, East Asia seas. And um, those, those uh, links were broken, so I just simply retweeted them. Uh, so people can see that this is, um, this is very much front and center. And so when you're being distracted by uh, various news stories, you ought to realize that this is simply to try to keep you from following the story. And I'm very happy to say that um, there are a lot of people following the story. Um, and those numbers are definitely um, up. They're, uh, they're being fiddled. One of the conversations that we had on the Twitter account were the ways that, um, that people are prevented from retweeting. Uh, in one case, my uh, account went dead for three hours. Um, but we know what they're doing, and people are definitely paying attention to what's going on. Um, why is it that I'm the one that gets to be doing this? It's because I worked in the World Bank legal department for 15 years. I was brought into the legal department by Ibrahim Shihada, who was the general counsel for OPEC. That's the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. The reason I believe, or one of the reasons, that Ibrahim Shihada brought me on board is because um, I had been very interested in the formation of what's now the Group of 77. Um, I went to uh, do a legislative history on that, and I published that story. And then when I went into the World Bank, I worked as the country lawyer for Jordan and Yemen for 10 years. So people could see that I didn't have an agenda of my own. My agenda was to be the lawyer in the World Bank. Before I went into the World Bank, I, I got a little bit of training 
from the longest serving general counsel, that's Aaron Brochus, and he told me that the position of the legal department was very central. It was actually more important than the position of the presidency. That's because the lawyer in the World Bank sits right between the board, which that's the countries. There's um, now a board of 25 executive directors. Eight of them represent the eight largest economies, and the rest, there are constituencies. And now there's also something called the Development Committee. That was brought in because people saw how the board was not functioning the way it needed to function. One of the things that I did before I was locked out of the World Bank was I wrote a legal opinion saying that the board had to take back control, that the presidency was not there to run the World Bank, and the managing director was not there to run the uh, International Monetary Fund. Uh, the minute I did that, that's when I was locked out, but I have just, I've been reinstated. Um, I bought a World Bank bond, and I sued under the securities laws. My lawsuit was settled, and uh, I've been, as you can see, I've been consulting with all of the embassies and with various countries, and uh, as I've mentioned in this, um, in this forum, any country that wants to say that I am not speaking on behalf of the Board of Governors of the World Bank and IMF, they are certainly welcome to go on record in writing. That was what I agreed with the uh, delegations when I uh, went to the uh, annual meetings in Lima, Peru, because uh, as you can see with the shenanigans that the CIA is pulling, it's important for somebody to be there and to, and to express what the Board of Governors um, needs to express in order to safeguard the world's assets for the world's people. And that's exactly what we're doing now. We are deploying the world's assets for the world's people, and that means that we are using the world's international monetary gold reserves to replace the worthless paper currencies before they crash. That's what this um, quantitative easing was designed to do, and we've showed in earlier broadcasts the graph that uh, compare what happened when the uh, currency in Rome was devalued, where they took the, uh, the metal out of the currency, out of the denarius, and we are now on the edge. Um, many people are asking me, when are we going to get this uh, currency reset going? Um, I can't obviously do it on my own, but I can tell you that the military is, and I mean the US military, is not about to sit back on its backside and let the Federal Reserve unilaterally surrender the United States military might. That's where we are. Um, we're not going to be doing this through a coup. As, as many people know, the United States is in an interregnum. Uh, we have a military government. We have had a military government since 1861, and the US Congress dutifully, because they are all bought and paid for by the network of global corporate control, they are all corrupt. They are dutifully extending a state of emergency so that our legal title is taken away from us. When you pay off your mortgage on your home, you're given, by the states, you're given warranty of title. You're not given the actual title. Uh, and the legal department, the legal profession is just um, corrupt. They're not telling you the way things really are. Um, so we are now in the process of taking back our legitimate government under Article 5 of the Constitution. And as, as we have this interregnum, and as we have to work together, um, we do not have a means of uh, arresting the elite. Um, the military, which is loyal to us, is not able to arrest the elite. The elite simply have to recognize that we know exactly who they are and what they're doing, and that their days are numbered, and they are to, um, they're to resign. Uh, in some cases, they're helping us, as you can see, some of the facts that we've been presenting. Um, let's <laughs> move to um, a piece of information which is very interesting um, that we received from a Dutch knight about um, Queen Victoria um, that we, we spoke about last week. Um, there's also um, a, a clip that I would like to show you from uh, a very talented um, economist in Sierra Leone, Malance 
Bart Williams. Good afternoon. I am Malenz, and I come from the richest country in the world. It is located in the richest continent in the world, in the west of the richest continent. My country is called Sierra Leone. On the surface, we are blessed with infinite beauty and abundance of flora and fauna. Producing the most exquisite harvest of coffee, cocoa, fruits, vegetables, and caoutchouc. You name it, we've got it. We also have diverse wildlife and ma vast marine resources and waterfalls and rivers, the most beautiful beaches. The land is gold. Besides gold and diamonds, we have about 20 precious minerals, huge petroleum reserves that have been discovered. We have platinum, ilminites to make titanium, rutile to coat jets, iron ore, tantalite, also known as coltan, used in your mobile phones and computers, bauxite for aluminium production, zinc, chrome ore, copper, coal, phosphates, potassium, salt, lead, granite, asbestos, nickel, circum. exquisite timber, like mahogany and tea. The first sub-Saharan university, prior to that, there was one in the kingdom of Timbuktu, which was the first university in the world. Which, of course, is inhabited by the most beautiful souls. And we have the most beautiful stems in the world. <laughs> of course, the West needs Africa's resources, most desperately, to power airplanes, cell phones, computers, and engines. And the golden diamonds, of course. A status symbol to determine their powers by decor and to give value to their currencies. One thing that keeps me puzzled, despite having studied finance and economics at the world's best universities, the following question remains unanswered. Why is it that 5,000 units of our currency is worth one unit of your currency, where we are the ones with the actual gold reserves? It's quite evident that the aid is in fact not coming from the West to Africa, but from Africa to the Western world. The Western world depends on Africa in every possible way, since alternative resources are scarce out here. So how does the West ensure that the free aid keeps coming? By systematically destabilizing the wealthiest African nations and their systems, and all that backed by huge PR campaigns. Leaving the entire world under the impression that Africa is poor and dying and merely surviving on the mercy of the West. Well done, Oxfam, UNICEF. Red Cross, Life Aid, and all the other organizations that continuously run multi-million dollar advertisement campaigns depicting charity porn to sustain that image of Africa globally. Ad campaigns paid for by innocent people under the impression to help with their donations. While one hand gives under the flashing lights of cameras, the other takes in the shadows. We all know the dollar is worthless, while the euro is merely charged with German intellect and technology, and maybe some Italian pasta. How can one expect donations from nations that have so little? It's super sweet of you to come with your colored paper in exchange for our golden diamonds. But instead, you should come empty-handed, filled with integrity and honor. We want to share with you our wealth and invite you to share with us. The perception is that a healthy and striving Africa would not disperse its resources as freely and cheaply, which is logical. Of course, it would instead sell its resources at world market prices, which in turn would destabilize and weaken Western economies. Established on the post-colonial free meal system. Last year, the IMF reports that six out of 10 of the world's fastest growing economies are in Africa, measured by their GDP growth. 
The French Treasury, for example, is receiving about $500 billion year in, year out. Foreign exchange reserves from African countries, based on colonial debt, they force them to pay. Former French President Jacques Chirac stated in an interview recently that we have to be honest and acknowledge that a big part of the money in our banks comes precisely from the exploitation of the African continent. In 2008, he stated that without Africa, France will slide down in the rank of a third world power. This is what happens in the human world, the world we have created. Have you ever wondered how things work in nature? One would assume that in evolution, the fittest survives. However, in nature, any species that over, is overhunting Overexploiting the resources they depend on as nourishment, natural selection would sooner or later take the predator out because it offsets the balance. And five, four, three, two. I'd like to talk now about a, a debate that we had. Um, we, meaning me and uh, someone who had written a story talking about how we were at end times and that uh, things were going to get very badly out of control. Um, and I took exception to that. I said that um, that wasn't necessarily going to be the case, that according to the power transition model that came to the World Bank from the Department of Defense, that we have a 90 to 95 percent likelihood of having a peaceful transition. This is because there's a coalition for the rule of law that consists of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, and also 134 developing countries called the Group of 77, and in the United States that the United States was going to get rid of the Federal Reserve and we were going to have a peaceful transition using constitutional currency because the Federal Reserve notes are unconstitutional. Well, this debate went on for um, a good week and a half, and uh, it was actually quite useful because it gave me the chance of understanding exactly where people can be confused, because this, um, this person, Carl Herman, um, was somebody who had gone systematically to all of the different um, currency reform fora to explain why it was that paper currency was not going to fail. Um, I just recently got an email from him uh, where he's asking me to explain about what it is that's, um, that's at risk. Paper currencies always crash. We have had gold currency as our monetary system, as our money, um, back, through, um, back through ancient time and going forward. And the reason is because gold is something called a store of value. It maintains its value. And so the very first thing that um, Carl Herman argued was that uh, the price of money fluctuates, uh, the price of gold fluctuates. And the actual price of gold is, um, is not being settled in the, uh, in the markets. That's because what you have is you have offers of gold for future settlement, uh, many, many times the amount of gold that's actually settled. Uh, this is not a credible way to settle what the price of gold is, because you see that the price of spot delivery, that's immediate delivery of gold, is, is higher. There's a premium there. This shows that, um, that paper currency is, is very vulnerable. And at a certain point, what invariably happens is that um, People will not sell their gold for any price because paper is paper and gold is gold. Uh, and so we, one of the other questions that, um, that Carl Herman wanted to know is, all right, I've been talking about um, the risk of permanent gold backwardation. When is it actually going to happen and what does it actually mean? He didn't understand that when you have permanent gold backwardation, that's, that's why we had the Dark Ages. What that means is that uh, you have no way to pay for international trade. And if you look at the goods 
and services, uh, there, many of them have components of um, foreign, foreign materials. If you, if you have no way to pay for these foreign materials, um, the trade is just going to come to a screeching halt. Uh, and once that happens, there's going to be chaos. Um, there's going to be starvation, and we certainly don't want to go there. So the, the challenge for us is for people to really start paying very careful attention. And as I've been telling you, um, the way you pay attention is not by reading the articles, because um, what you get in the mainstream media and in 80% of the, um, the alternative media, that is bought and paid for by the network of global corporate control. We've been discussing why it is that people should accept an amnesty for the agents of the network of global corporate control. This is so that we can have a peaceful, smooth transition, and so that that transition can happen before permanent gold backwardation. Until next week, I'm your host, Karen Hudis, and I thank you for listening to another segment of the Network of Global Corporate Control. It's okay to admit what we do not know, and the first thing to admit is that we like to hide unpleasant facts from ourselves. The way to build on this understanding is to realize that this is a very human trait, and that we're all in the same boat and all need to accept other people's help to understand ourselves and overcome our blind spots. As a common starting point, Let's agree that we do not understand our common history. Here's an ancient mystery that we do not understand the first thing about. It's about extensive ancient underground networks that have been discovered throughout Europe. Uh, ever since ground-penetrating radar was declassified, we've been learning about tunnels under literally hundreds of Neolithic settlements all over Europe. These tunnels are more than 12,000 years old. The fact that so many of them still exist indicates that the original networks must have been huge. And the picture that you're looking at right now is in Turkey. It's in a site called Durankuyu, and that's probably the largest underground city that's been discovered to date. It spans more than eight levels, going as deep as 80 meters, with more than 600 entrances at the surface. Although the date that the original city was built is unknown, the Turkish Department of Culture dates the city back to the 8th century BC. It was made by a group called the Phrygians. That's an ancient Indo-European people who worshiped the Great Mother Cybal, as the Greeks and Romans knew her. The Phrygians developed an advanced culture which was famous for its music and the legend of King Midas, who was a Phrygian king who turned everything he touched into gold. That's in Europe. In Guatemala, there's 800 kilometers worth of tunnels that have been mapped underneath the Mayan pyramid complex at Tikal. Researchers have suggested that this may provide an explanation for how half a million Mayans escaped the decimation of their culture. In Egypt, caverns have been mapped showing the existence of massive chambers larger than our largest cathedrals. A few historians believe that the underground cave system in Giza is the legendary city of the gods. That's the massive underground city that was described by ancient writers Herodotus, that's in the 5th century BC, and Strabo in the 1st century AD. Herodotus wrote, There I saw 12 palaces regularly disposed, which had communication with each other, interspersed with terraces and arranged around 12 halls. It's hard to believe they're the work of man. The walls are covered with carved figures, and each court is exquisitely built of white marble and surrounded by a colonnade. Near the corner where the labyrinth ends, there's a pyramid 240 feet in height, 
with great carved figures of animals on it and an underground passage by which it can be entered. I was told very credibly that underground chambers and passages connected this pyramid with the pyramids at Memphis. There are other ancient writers, including Lamblicus, a fourth century writer, who told about an entranceway through the body of the Sphinx into the Great Pyramid. This entrance, obstructed in our day by sands and rubbish, may still be traced between the forelegs of the crouched Colossus. In the belly of the Sphinx were cut out galleries leading to the subterranean part of the Great Pyramid. These galleries were so artfully crisscrossed along their course to the pyramid that in setting forth into the passage without a guide throughout this network, one ceasingly and inevitably returned to the starting point. We've been discussing why it is that people should accept an amnesty for the agents of the network of global corporate control so that we can have the global currency reset. I'm going to be uploading some more of the DC TV segments on the internet and we'll be continuing to have a dialogue about the reasons for the amnesty. Until next week, I'm your host, Karen Hudis, and I thank you for listening to another segment of the Network of Global Corporate Control.